Welcome to the Apartment Investor Show, where we help you get smart and invest smarter in multifamily real estate. I'm your host, Jason Castillo, founder and managing principal of the Multifamily Property Group. And joining me as always is my good buddy, my good friend, my co-host, the godfather of lending, Mr. Paul Peebles, national underwriter for Old Capital Lending. Paulie, how are you doing today? We're doing great. Uh, we're having a, a great uh, first quarter of 2020 on the lending side. Uh, super excited that uh, the gates are wide open. Money is flowing. And I think 2020 is going to be a great year to look back at. Uh, we locked a, a rate today, uh, to be honest with you, at 3.68% fixed for 12 years with five years of interest only and a $24 million transaction. So that just gives you kind of a flavor where rates are today or where rates have been at the probably the last couple last week of, of February or so. So, you know, fantastic. The, uh, you know, some, some, the, the goals for 2020 are going to be blown away. So in the podcast today, we're, we're excited to, this is kind of the second part of our conversation. Uh, hopefully you watched uh, part number one and um, we're going to talk a little bit uh, about sizing alone. So JC kind of, Tell us a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, well, you know, Polly, as we always say, we do not like talking heads. We like to hear our information from the experts, and that is why and what we are all about on this show. And last week, we brought on two experts that talked about how to quickly underwrite an apartment property uh, to make sure that you need to spend more time uh, doing the, the detailed analysis or throw it in the trash can. Well, the second part and the follow-up of what our listeners uh, are going to be excited to hear is we're also going to today, today talk about how to do a back-of-the-napkin analysis on the loan sizing and the loan for that apartment property, how to quickly determine whether this loan uh, and how this loan is going to function for that apartment property. And so without any further ado, let's go ahead and welcome back uh, to the show, Mr. Lane Bean and Mr. Spencer Burton to the show. Guys, thanks a lot for joining us and welcome again to the show. Thank you, JC. Thank you, Paul, so much for giving us the opportunity to share with your audience what we've learned in our real estate experiences. My experience has been as an operator and dealing with experts like Paul and like Spencer and Spencer's experiences are on the underwriting side and true evaluation. I've known Spencer for several years now and lean on him extensively and he's my go-to guy to help me really understand how to make a value of a uh, property. And the thing that Paul mentioned and the thing that JC's mentioned, and as you as investor audience, you've probably seen a lot of deals come across your desk or a lot of talk about deals, especially as this year has changed in the 2020. And I've seen three or four deals just today through email. So how do you know if this is something you really want to spend some time pursuing how do you want to know if you want to gin up some support and go look at the property? And then how much loan do you put on this property? How much can you qualify for? And what's that going to look like for your investor return? So this is a really, really fundamental property or fundamental principle that as a sponsor or as a limited partner or as an investor, you just have to understand well and you have to get it right. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about that, Spencer. What's your knowledge on that? What's your experience and the, and the change or transition in this new year and the amount of deal flow and uh, seeing that sort of thing? What's been your observation just recently? Yeah. Uh, well, first off, thank, thank you guys again for having me on. Uh, it truly is a pleasure. And, and this, is, this is something I really enjoy talking about, uh, uh, as I think we all do. Um, in terms of you know, where the market's at, you know, it, good question. I, Deal volume is going to be dependent on market, property type. Uh, I think in the value-add apartment space, it's as healthy as it's ever been in terms of deal volume, right? There, there's a lot of liquidity. When I say liquidity, that means there's a lot of properties trading hands. Uh, there's a lot of buyers in the market. There's uh, plenty of sellers in the market. Um, there, there may be um, n not enough sellers in the market and not had too many buyers in the market, but that's, that's up for, uh, for discussion. But either way, uh, you know, there, there's a lot going on in this value add apartment space. And so that, and that, in fact, that's what we're talking about today, right guys is, uh, uh last week we talked through just how to put together a, a basic analysis, a back of the envelope analysis to determine whether 
a deal was worth spending a little bit more time with. Uh, today, what I'd like to really dig in on uh, is how do we know if we can put the capital together to actually make this deal happen? And, and part of this discussion, I'd like it to be quantitative. In fact, I'll uh, share my screen with us really quickly and I'll, I'll remind uh, the audience if, uh, if, if they will, this deal that we were looking at. Uh, and then I wanna kick it back to uh, Lane and, and to Paul, uh, you two JC, to talk through the qualitative aspects of putting capital together for a deal like this. So uh, let me set it up, remind the audience, this is a 80s bill garden style apartment project, again, hypothetical in Fort Worth, Texas, in place, the property is currently only 76% occupied. Uh, and so they're, they're getting market rents for the units. They're just not, it's not fully leased and it's a, it's a management issue. And so we believe as a potential acquirer that we could come in, bring in our management team and, and get this thing to full occupancy. And when we do that, if I scroll down here, you'll see in place net operating income of 500,000, which has been dropping year over year. Uh, since 2017, we believe that simply by leasing this up with with our again this is hypothetical, but with our optimal uh, management team, we would hit almost 800,000 in NOI with that change. And as a result, where we would pay 10 and a half million for this property today, if this property were were fully leased, we believe today it would be worth 11 and a half million. And so, how do we put 10 and a half million together? Because this seems like a a decent deal, right, in, in uh, the hypothetical. How do we put this 10 and a half million together? Well, we call that our sources of capital. And it's a combination of debt capital and what, what we call equity capital. Uh, to the layman, equity is uh, the difference between what you owe on your house and what your house is worth, right? Well, in, in commercial real estate, equity is the amount of, of capital that, that uh, private and public individuals put into an investment with unlimited risk, right? All, it could lose 100% of their money or unlimited upside. If, if the project really was a home run, the, the yield would be substantial, right? Great return. That's, our, that's the equity capital. Where the debt capital, their risk is, is limited to whatever they have, uh, but their, their upside is limited to whatever the coupon is of, of the rate. So, that's debt and equity capital. And the question first is, how much debt capital could we put on this? And what type of debt would we go out and, and, and secure here? And so uh, what, what I like to do as I'm doing analysis is first, I'm going to underwrite the, as if the property were fully leased today. And that means I would go out and get the, the best financing possible. We call that permanent debt. Uh, it's likely on this sort of deal to be an agency loan or a life insurance loan. Those are going to give you the lowest rates uh, at the best terms. And, and, and so in this case, we would like, let's say, 70% of the value of the property. Uh, and Paul might balk at that, but I'm going to say 70% of the value of the property is what we think, if this was fully leased today, we could go out and borrow. And we think we could borrow at, uh, what was Paul saying, 368? So I'm going to say 370 rate. And that would be a 30-year amortization and a 10-year term, okay? And this is amortizing, so there's no interest-only period on this loan. In fact, with no interest-only, I think Paul's example had five years of I.O., so I'm going to say five and a half because I'm an aggressive underwriter here uh, in our hypothetical. And what we have then is an $8.1 million loan on a value of $11.5 million. Now, remember, we're paying only ten and a half for this. But at whatever point that this is worth eleven and a half, we think we can go get an $8.1 million loan, which means we need to raise at, at minimum $2.389 million of equity capital at the point when this property is fully leased. Uh, now, in terms of the, and, and if you see here, I've dropped in a couple of metrics. And these metrics give us a kind of a reality check as to whether this is realistic or not. And the first metric is loan to value. And you'll, you'll talk to Paul or, or one of his team members, and they'll tell you on these sorts of properties, if it's fully stabilized, this is the loan to value you can get. So we're going to say, you know, 70% we think uh, is possible. The second is debt yield. Some lenders care about this, others don't. But debt yield is 
the return that the lender would get on this investment if they took it back today. Or in other words, it's net operating income divided by loan amount. And, and here we have 9.29%. And we're gonna say in the market right now, uh, lenders are sizing to a minimum debt yield of eight, and so 9.29 is healthy. The last that we have is called debt service coverage ratio. And this is basically the delta between how much operating cash flow, net operating and cash flow, or in our case here, cash flow from operations, the, how much cash flow is the property throwing off in a, in a given period relative to the loan payment that's due. We call that debt service. And to calculate this one, we need to drop in a debt service payment into our stabilized pro forma. Now, I have already calculated here the monthly payment, 36,418. So I just need to do a calculation of a annual payment. So I take this monthly payment, multiply it by 12. I get a payment of 437,000. And this particular a quick model I put together estimates the debt service coverage at 1.72 times. And we're gonna say that the lenders in the market have a minimum debt service coverage requirement of 125 and therefore this 172 is sufficient. And so based on this back of the napkin analysis, we believe, again, once fully leased, that we could borrow this 8.1 million and this would be our debt service coverage and therefore our cash on cash return, cash on cash return being the cash flow from operation or net, net operating income, I'm kind of using those interchangeably here, divided by the amount of equity capital contributed to date, or a 13% annual, or in this case, in this first year, 13% return on my capital. Um, now, what's the problem? And this is where I'm gonna finally kick it back to Paul. Uh, we probably can't borrow $8.1 million today. Why? Because this property is only 76% leased, and, and an agency, uh, the agencies probably aren't going to lend on an unstabilized property such as this. And so we're going to have to find some uh, stopgap, some sort of financing to get us from today until our stabilization. So let me kick it back to you, uh, Paul, and, and why don't you talk through that? Like, how would you look at this from a lender standpoint? What recommendations would you give to us if we were looking at this a hypothetical deal? So if we, if we, Go back to it one more time. Let's see if we can sure. go back to your chart. I think what you'll see all the way to the top, just what Spencer was saying, is that this is 76% occupied. So that's physical occupancy. And so that, that's a concern. So out of 100, 100 beds, 76 of them are, are rented out, but you may have um, 76 rented out, but uh, maybe only 60 or 65 are actually paying the rent of the 76, six people. So physical occupancy, 76, economic occupancy is a lot less than that on this property. So we're concerned. So that's not gonna meet Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac because they wanna see 90 plus percent physical occupancy and maybe 85% economic occupancy in the property. So that's what their rule is going to be. So it's not gonna it's not gonna meet the Fannie Mae Freddie Mac guidelines for a stabilized property because it's not a stabilized property. It is a distressed asset for some reason just because the occupancy is not there, the income is not there. So let's scroll our way back down. And I would imagine that what we would probably do is a bridge loan on this transaction. And the bridge loan was would really be based on the acquisition price of the property and any rehab dollars into the transaction itself. So if we had rehab dollars of five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars, we would add that into the transaction. So acquisition price plus the rehab dollars would give me the the full uh, cost of doing the transaction. So I guess eleven million dollars would be our full all in. And then I would probably start at about maybe seventy five percent leverage in that one. And so what I'm looking for is, is a debt yield. So similar to what Spencer's doing, if you scroll down debt yield, going in, I can do a loan up to as low as a five and a quarter, wow. five and a half debt yield in that transaction. And then over a period of time, the property is going to, uh, the, the operating statement is going to look a little bit like a hockey stick. It's going to go down because now we have, we're going to start putting rehab dollars into the transaction and occupancy is going to fall because now you got a new sheriff in town. And so my debt yield is going to probably start at five, 
five and a quarter, five and a half, and it may go down to four, but it's trying to work its way up to 11. Because I like to see eight and a half to 11 is, is kind of telling me where my stabilized debt yield, where we want to be at that period of time. After the work has been done, after the acquisition has been done, and the rehab has been completed, then we're looking for possibly a refinance or a sale at that period of time. So again, we're working for, you know, uh, that rate too, the interest rate is not going to be three and a half, but it's going to probably be four and a half, five percent, somewhere in there. So four and a half is, you know, five percent is a good rate. And so, uh, you know, that, you know, if we change the, uh, I guess, uh, I guess advertising makes sense on that deal. And it's, you know, we're going to probably have uh, two to three years of interest only. So it's a bridge loan. It's a bridging the, the transaction from a distressed asset to a stabilized asset. And so this type of a transaction would be a bridge loan. Uh, PC, uh, guys, any additional thoughts on this? Yeah, let, let me ask a few questions if, if I could, Paul. So let, let me put on the hat of a potential acquirer here. Uh, who would the, what type of, of lenders are offering these short-term bridge loans? These are gonna be like debt funds are gonna do it. They're also gonna be large national banks because in the space that we're going to do on this size of a transaction with a minimum of a $5 million loan, it's going to be maybe a national bank that has a presence that's going to be able to do a non-recourse transaction at that five, four and a half to five percent range. And it's not going to be, it's not going to be fixed for 10 years. It's not going to be fixed for seven. It's going to probably be an adjustable rate. And it's going to be for say three years with two one-year extensions. So you have, you know, you pay, maybe pay a fee to get the first extension, pay another fee to get the second, second extension. But uh, there are a number of uh, lenders out there. They're really looking for properties in bigger markets. So like, you know, all of say New Jersey, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Orange County. If it's in smaller markets, they may not do it because they're looking for what the work and the employment and everything that associated with the big towns. So these type of loans are available for, say, the, the larger markets. Spencer, anything else? Yeah. Um, so in, in terms of fees, uh, and I know this varies from debt fund to debt fund and maybe from, from bank to bank, but compare fee, talk to us about the fees that you'd expect on a bridge loan compared to an agency loan. So the, so the property is a sick property. So we got we to we gotta take a prescription and, and uh, make it better. So a bridge loan is, is not a, a Fannie Mae loan. It's not gonna be held for a long period of time. It's only there for a couple of years. And so the fees on this, they're, they're typically gonna charge maybe a point to a point and a half on the front when you originate the loan. And typically maybe 1%, zero or 1% on the exit. So it's like, a, it's like a prepayment penalty to get out of the transaction. But again, it's gonna be non-recourse. And so, uh, you know, just like a Fannie Mae loan, which is non-recourse, uh, a Freddie Mac loan is non-recourse, this is non-recourse. So this is, if you walked into a regular bank like Bank of America or Wells Fargo, and you were going to do a loan with them, they typically would be on a bank loan or a bridge loan, they would be recourse. So you yeah. would have your balance sheet exposed. Non-recourse means your balance sheet's not exposed, just the property and the cash flow itself. So they're hanging their hat on the, the few, the current cash flow and the future cash flow and wherever, wherever that's going to wind up to be. So they want to look for like an experienced operator, like guys like Lane, guys like JC that have done this in the past. They want to take a look at that. But that is typically what we're going to see. 75% loan, they can go up to sometimes 80%, sometimes 100% rehab thrown into the loan itself. A couple of years of interest only. And then when it's ready to go, uh, they'll just, they'll, they're going to charge an exit fee to get out of it. And then you just roll that either into a sale, sell, sell the property because you now your, your property hopefully is now worth 11 or 12, $13 million, or you're going to refinance it at a, at a rate that's going to be, you know, today is what we said was 3.68%. And so, so, uh, you know, gives you some options. Yeah. So, so let's, let's come back to this example here. Uh, let me make some tweaks to this so we can get to what, uh, what Paul was saying. So you, you were saying about 75% of cost is where we could expect to be here, right? And uh, yeah, let's come back to I our- I go all the way down to a debt yield of say five and a quarter. And all the way, so we could go to a, a minimum of, 
So is there, so would you say 75% of cost is your max five and a quarter is your minimum debt yield? I actually, um, let's, so I, I actually can go up to almost 80% leverage wow. in a, in a non-recourse loan, 80% leverage on a non-recourse bridge loan. And I can get my debt yield all the way down to say five and a quarter percent. Wow. Okay, great. So here, I'm going to take this to, so what I'm looking at right now is this percent of cost. So 77.24, I'm going to get it to about 80%. Because um, we like we like to hear that. Oh, I got right there. Okay. And uh, right now this debt yield isn't true because that's based on our stabilized. So let's do the calculation, right? We, we look at this number and divide that by this loan amount. So we got a 472. So we know we can't borrow 8.4 million, even so if we're up there. Yeah, that's right. That's too, too low. So let's come six. So 71% of cost, we're at a 526 debt yield. Is that about right? That rings the bell right there. Okay. So, we have, <coughs> excuse me. We've got a seven and a half million dollar bridge loan. Uh, what about debt service coverage? Do they care? And then the reason I ask, let's actually really quick before you answer that, let's calculate what our debt service coverage would be here. Uh, we are just under 1.0, right? So there is, it in place today, there's, there's negative cash flow after paying the debt service payment. Does that matter to these debt funds? It does to a certain extent. They're more, they're going to look at both. They're going to look at the, say the five and a quarter minimum, but they also want to see a 1.0 debt service coverage, which means again, is that this property has to be making enough money right now just to cover the debt, not to, to have any profit to get the debt service coverage ratio, but they just want to go one to one or 1.01, something that just covers the debt. So, Let's make it two thresholds, one at five and a quarter debt, debt uh, yield and 1.0 for the, uh, the debt service coverage ratio. All right, so we'll, we'll take our, let's take our loan amount right to there. Okay, we're a 1.0 coverage. Yep. We're a 540 debt yield, so we're above the five and a quarter and we're under our 80% loan to cost. Yep. Uh, so it looks like we can borrow about 7.35 million. I, I think for, for um, conservative, to be conservative, maybe we take it to 7.3 million. And so as we're doing this underwriting right now, we're, we're going, all right, we can borrow about 7.3 million. We're gonna spend the time to lease this up. And once it's fully stabilized, if you, rec if you recall, 8.1 is what we believe the new loan would be at 70%. Do you think, Paul, we could borrow more than 70% on a, uh, on a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan stabilized here? Uh, not right now, but in the okay. future, we could. Okay. So I, our 70% was a fair number. And so therefore, when we sell this, uh, we're going to take about $800,000 worth of equity off the table. Uh, we have to raise roughly $3.2 million, and we can give some equity back to our partners at that stage. Elaine, I'm going to kick it to you now. So if, if you're representing a, a group of investors looking at possible deals, what do you think about in terms of equity contribution here? And is, is getting, call it 25% of your equity at stabilization back and then holding this long term with a partner, partner is that going to be attractive enough to uh, an equity investor? Yeah, that's a great point, Spencer. So as you were talking about this and Paul were talking about this, I was thinking of this as the deal sponsor. And JC and I probably were thinking about this in a different aspect than Paul was. He's thinking about it as a lender. We're thinking about this as a different aspect and a different attack angle than you're talking about, Spencer, because you're talking about the underwriting. So let me see if I can address probably what JC and I were talk are thinking about. And this is the what this is the way I would formalize this is anytime I look at these investments and I've I've uh, coordinated with Spencer to get this information. I've coordinated with Paul, and then now I come in and I try to build the strategy. Okay, uh, there's four components of my investment decision: strategy, market, team, and property. What you're talking about here in this category is the property returns, the property financing. But I have to step back and say, what is going to be the strategy? And so what I do is I take this information that you've given me and you've given me a return where I've looked at it. Maybe I've calculated it myself. I've looked at this spread, investment spread, development spread. And then now I've formulated that into my investment strategy 
and the story behind this property that I'm going to now take to my equity partners and I'm going to take it to my debt partner and explain it to Paul. I'm going to say, Paul, this is a value add opportunity in this market. And I'm going to describe, and I think you said the quantitative or the subjective opinions. Some of this is not as objective as these hard numbers. It's more of a subjective approach. Hey, what's the trend in this market? Is the market going up? People moving into the market, job growth in the market, supply and demand out of balance. That's going to help me formalize my strategy. From that strategy, I'm going to pair it together with the property data and the return and investment data that we're calculating off of this spreadsheet. So those things are what I'm thinking about. How does this fit into my investment strategy? And now, can I sell that strategy to my equity partners who are going to give me money to invest in this property for a particular return? Can I explain and can I justify the risk of buying an under uh, occupied property in this market with this property management team? And what is going to be my business plan to execute success? Because Spencer, let's say you brought me this opportunity or JC brought me this opportunity and said, Lane, I want you to invest. Here's the deal. Here's the uh, story behind this property. And then here's the numbers. We have a loan to cost of this amount. We have a debt cost of this amount. I've already talked to Paul about gap funding or about uh, the bridge funding. And really what I'm listening for, and as a limited partner in your audience, JC, or as I'm uh, up and coming or as an up and comer sponsor, it's really important that you're able to translate this into a business plan, into a investment strategy that makes sense with your market, with your team, and with this specific property, considering the risk. So I know I didn't really answer your question specifically, <laughs> Spencer, and I answered it a long way, but the important part is that I want to communicate is as a sponsor, okay, I'm soliciting expert advice from Spencer Burton. He's the best. And then JC, I see what's your take. To yeah. So, do the same. you know, um, Spencer, to answer your question, you know, what, what we're going to do in terms of once you've done this back of the envelope um, loan sizing is we're going to basically, first thing we're going to do is look at the back end uh, refinancing into the Fannie Mae loan. And we're going to bring that out to, let's say like a 10 year term. So let's say that we're in this, um, you know, this bridge loan for about a year and a half or so, and then we get it to a stabilized position. And let's say a year and a half from there, we put it into a Fannie Mae loan. So we're going to model the equity, the financing costs to get into the bridge, into the permanent debt in this, in the, in the, in the, in, the, in, in a year and a half from the time we acquire the property and put the bridge debt on. And we're going to take a look at what those 10 years of pro forma operations look like with the Fannie Mae permanent loan in place. And we're going to basically do an assessment right at the very get. And we're going to say, does this make sense for us to exit the deal after the year and a half of stabilization based on what we can bring out on the equity piece with the sale of the property? Or if we see that the property is going to be really uh, rocking and rolling based on putting permanent debt over a 10 year hold and we feel like we've got a property that's got a good quality uh, runway to it, then we, we look at that deal. We may say, okay, you know what? It makes more sense in that particular case to hold the deal to a maturity with the permanent debt on in place, because that's going to ultimately be a better total return for us in the long run. I and so that, that's, that's the way yeah. that we're going to look at this deal and decide what we want to do from, uh, you know, from the get. The other thing that I would say that's really important to understand, and this is a nuance that, I think a lot of people miss. So when you're going from a, uh, a bridge debt to stabilized debt and the very front end, what you want to do is you want to, not only do you want to get the maximum loan that you can get from the bridge lender, because sometimes they're going to be willing to give you 80% plus some of the renovation costs, but you also want to sort of fast forward in your mind and in your model and say, okay, a year and a half from now, Let's look at let's look at how much the le the the permanent lender was going to be willing to give us because in a lot of cases if you get over your skis with bridge loan and you take too much of the loan on the bridge and then you try to refinance into permanent debt on the back end the Fannie Mae guy may not be able to give you enough loan proceeds to actually let you uh, 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 refinance into the to the new uh, permanent debt and so 
there's a real big consideration on the front end that you need so, to do. So that is a big, that. big, yeah. So that is an absolute big concern that uh, the JC brings up because if you take a look at the underwritten value of the property being eleven million five eighty five on the right hand side there, eleven million five eighty five, we are going to do with Fannie Mae. If you're looking for cash out, seventy percent is max cash out. So if you're looking to refinance, and so eight point one in the, right now our loan amount on the bridge would be seven point two nine. So you'd be looking for some cash out, but to be specific to JC's concern, you know, we're, we're just putting a wag out there that we think that 11.58 is going to be our value after the property is stabilized. It, it may not be that amount. It may be less. It may be more, but it may be less. Yeah. So again, we, we want to be, be careful that uh, the maximum that we can do since we own the property is 75%. So we'd have to, to kind of stress the deal out is if we were going to keep the property, we were going to refinance off the bridge loan and go into the perma loan for Fannie Mae, the maximum leverage we could do is 75% of the of the, the valuation of the property. So we do have some runway. Again, we're not giving cash back, but we're just refinancing the current debt on the bridge loan and making it the permanent debt with closing costs into the new Fannie Mae loan too. We yeah, that's sure a really good point. And value. I think what, one of the tips I can give listeners out there is what we like to do is once we build out our, our, our pro forma model, we will basically take our Fannie Mae partner and send them our, you know, the, the NOI, expected NOI, let's say in the second year when we're going to refinance into the permanent debt and say, hey, listen, make some safe assumptions on an interest rate and tell us how much you think you can loan us on this property based on this projected NOI. And then we're going to go back once we get that information from, from that Fannie Mae lender or, or that agency debt partner. And we're going to go back and, and we're going to make sure that with the bridge loan that we're getting, that we're not getting over our skis in terms of taking too much lender capital from the bridge guy so that we don't get stuck in the mud in two years from now. And remember that you can always raise more capital on the front end to bring into the deal as opposed to getting over leverage and giving yourself some sticky situations in the second year on the back end. Yeah, great. Uh, Another great point. The other point that I would make is great plans can become great failures within the plan itself. And that, uh, remember, uh, a bridge loan is not a a final solution. It is just a temporary gap loan to get you from from the acquisition to the permanent loan. It is not meant to be the only way of doing it. So you always have to think what the backside and what the downside could be if you couldn't execute execute your plan, you know, after you, you did the acquisition, could you rehab the property to get the higher rates? Could you get the higher uh, net rental income into the deal? And hopefully, is there going to be an exit strategy with uh, a permanent solution on the backside? What happens if Fannie Mae is not there? God forbid. How could you keep, keep this property, keep all your equity investors into the deal would you have to go to a bank loan and, and what would that look like too? So it's a little bit playing uh, chess on two or three different levels when you're doing this. And I can't think of a better guy within Spencer and, and Lane and JC to give input and advice. So I think we'll, we'll probably finish it up this, this podcast. We, we can take that down. That's fantastic. Thanks, Spencer. Some great information. So we definitely appreciate that. JC, if somebody wanted to get more information about a little bit about what you do, what's the best, best uh, way to get a hold of you? Yeah, what, what it is that we do is, uh, I mean, we help investors make smart investment decisions at our company, the Multifamily Property Group. I mean, it's the whole reason that Paul and I started this, uh, this apartment investor show. Um, we've been doing this for 13, 14 years. We have been through uh, the recession, the Great Recession, we were buying apartment properties before the recession, Great Recession, we were buying them after the Great Recession. And so we have learned a thing or two about how to protect our capital and make smart investment decisions. And I am always willing to sit, at, sit down with anyone out there that has questions on how they should be getting started or what investment strategy they might want to look at for multifamily. You can go to our website at multifamilypropertygroup.com. Again, that's multifamilypropertygroup.com. And you can request a free 50-minute consultation with me. Go to the contact us section of our website and request it. And I would be happy to sit down for a few minutes and see how we can possibly help you out. Polly? And uh, Lane, what do you do? And how can you help people out? 
Right. I'm in the same space that JC's in. My motto is help you become a better millionaire, help you utilize investments in real estate to develop passive income so you can pursue your life's passions. You can connect with me through my website, apilot-legacy.com, and I'll give you some information about how you can do that. Or you can connect email with me, lane.bean at pilot-legacy.com. That's great. And Spencer, tell us a little bit about uh, adventures in, in CRE. Sure. Yeah. You know, we are real estate analysis educators. Uh, it's a passion of ours. My, my co-contributor and I were uh, in, industry professionals. Uh, so we're out there actually on the front lines representing institutions, acquiring uh, and making investments in real estate. And we do adventures in CRE.com as uh, you call it a side hustle, Paul. We, we call it our, uh, our hobby. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's your passion. It's, it's our passion. You know, we, we love it. Uh, uh, while y'all were watching the Super Bowl, I was building a model for, uh, for a blog post. Uh, you know, that's, that's kind of how, how adventures in CRE.com works. We have a great audience and we, we just teach people how, how to look at the numbers when it comes to real estate. And you and Lane are in the future going to have um, kind of an educational piece that's coming out and, and you go online and maybe go in a little bit more detail and depth than what we had just done here in 20 minutes. Have you guys got that uh, put together yet? Yeah, it's something that we're, uh, we're socializing, right? Uh, we're, we're, we're thinking through how best to approach it. I have a training program, uh, a premium training program that many of, of, of the, the users of Ventures and CRE.com uses. And so what Lane and I are thinking of creating is uh, kind of a high level look at analysis and help, help help jumpstart people who aren't sure even where to begin. Uh, and great. so we're, we're working on that. And uh, yeah, I imagine sometime this year, you'll, you'll see those uh, starting to trickle out, Paul. I can't wait. I can't wait. So Spencer, thanks for your, your time today. Lane, thanks for your time. And JC, always a pleasure. I'm Paul Peebles. Have a great day.